Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so this is West Coast Machine Learning and tonight we're gonna be discussing uh, diffusion policy. This is a recent paper about using diffusion uh, generative models to control um, robot motion using uh, video input. So um, as kind of an agenda, I put these items together. I don't know how much we're going to be able to cover. I would like to cover um, a couple topics right at the end. So if somebody could, we start getting close to um, uh, 8 o'clock, 20 till or something like that. People, if somebody could interrupt me and we'll jump to the last uh, couple items on that. But <clears throat> I wanted to do a quick review on um, what diffusion looks like in low dimensions. Um, then we'll go through the policy paper. I wanted to poke a little bit at what's the data that's um, released with that. Um, and then maybe we'll be able to dive in through the code. I had hoped to play with the code a little bit more, but um, the, the site, the authors provided a couple of collabs, but it took, um, they weren't working. And so it took a while to get that done. So we might not be able to do much there. Um, there was a couple other things then um, this robot development environment that I stumbled across in the end, um, and then another paper that we'll uh, just touch on. That sounds okay. Um, so this is the paper. Um, it's Diffusion Policy, Visual Motor Policy Learning via Action Diffusion. Uh, that'll be the link to the um, paper. I've also posted that in the meetup notes. Um, there's also a blog, um, that's the second link, um, and I think we'll be using, we'll actually probably go through both of those. I'm going to do it kind of in a, let's, let's do a video, let's do a, um, the blog and let's do a paper. So we'll kind of repeat a little bit, um, diving into different details kind of at each step. Interesting point here is this is, um, comes out of Columbia University, but um, quite a few of the folks um, are from the Toyota Research Institute and they actually are the ones that have the video uh, that we'll be looking at. Um, okay, so this is a, um, I think it was a press release, yeah, from um, Toyota that talks about um, this diffusion policy. Um, and I'm going to hopefully, we can just watch this video. Everybody see that? I'm going to play it briefly and you can tell me if you can hear it or somebody can thumbs up or something. Has to make contact with a surface it can't see. Without a sense of touch, it struggles Looks good. and performs poorly but is successful in learning the skill once it's able to okay, feel its interaction right with the environment. <laughs> Start from the beginning. Is it loud enough? I can hear it, but a little louder would be better for me. Here at TRI, yeah. we believe yeah, we like a little loud too people. possible. At home and at work. To achieve this, we conduct cutting edge research to make robots more flexible, robust, and general. Is that okay then? Noise yeah, that was better. Okay. That was better. Okay. Purpose. We've had a bit of a breakthrough. Today, TRI is announcing a new method to teach robots dexterous skills quickly and easily. Our approach is built on a powerful generative AI technique called diffusion policy. This allows us to teach robots much faster and with significantly fewer demonstrations. The approach holds great promise for creating what we call large behavior models. Just like large language models have revolutionized chatbots, these behavior models will allow robots to perform useful work in ways never possible before. Up until now, the majority of robotic manipulation work has focused on pick and place style tasks, where a robot is limited to relatively simple sets of objects it's rearranging. Our new approach goes significantly beyond that and lets us explore much closer to the limits of the hardware. TRI's robots are now capable of using tools, pouring liquids, and peeling vegetables. It's exciting to see them engaging with their environments in rich, multifaceted ways and all achieved without changing any code or explicitly programming any new skills. Using this technique, we've taught over 60 diverse behaviors to our fleet of robots. The process starts with a teacher demonstrating a small set of skills through teleoperation. Then our AI-based diffusion policy learns in the background over a matter of hours. It's common for us to teach a robot in the afternoon, let it learn overnight, and then come in the next morning to a working new behavior. To make this level of dexterity possible, Every part of the robot platform must be solid, from the hardware all the way up through the entire software stack. One key enabler is providing human teachers with a sense of touch through a haptic teleop device. Also, just like people, we found that robots learn better when they have a sense of touch. 
And a perfect example of this is the task of flipping a pancake, where the robot has to make contact with a surface it can't see. Without a sense of touch, it struggles and performs poorly, but it's successful in learning the skill once it's able to feel its interaction with the environment. This is only the beginning. Our team is deeply focused on achieving large behavior models that I mentioned earlier. We anticipate the next breakthrough will be when we've trained the robots with enough dexterous skills that they're able to generalize, performing a new skill that they've never been taught. To realize this, we're building a diverse curriculum for robot learning, essentially a kindergarten for robots, to teach them numerous foundational skills that are useful for working alongside people. We're on pace to teach hundreds of new behaviors by the end of the year, and over a thousand by the end of 2024. We're also leveraging our expertise in simulation to augment our real world teaching. And finally, we're developing fundamental tools for fleet learning so that when one robot learns, they all learn. I've been working in robotics research for a long time now. The tasks that I'm watching these robots perform are simply amazing. Even a year ago, I would not have predicted we were this close to this level of dexterity. And the rate at which we're able to teach new skills is simply astounding. Nearly every day, I wake up to a new message showing the robot doing something it couldn't do the day before. This is an incredible time to be a roboticist. Okay, so that was, um, there was quite a bit of additional stuff from Toyota there. I decided since it was Toyota played a big part in this to go ahead and let that all roll out. But um, that kind of sets the foundation for um, what we're trying to do with with the diffusion policy. Um, so it's a learning by example, essentially, uh, in a stable and efficient way. Um, before I dive in, I wanted to, I thought it'd be helpful to do just a, a quick um, run through what does diffusion look like, um, or diffusion generative models look like in low dimensions. I think, Dave, most of the stuff that we talked about um, or that you presented we thought of diffusion, it kind of equate it to one of these image, text image generative models. Um, and I'd, I remember seeing on this um, Lillian log um, or Lilla log, the, uh, an example of using, what do they call it? A Swiss roll example that was in, in uh, low dimensions. Um, and I kind of, that helped my thinking as I was thinking about how this, um, diffusion would actually work with robotics. Robotics, basically, you're going to end up controlling, you know, just the, the robot generally angles. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it's a few small number of, of angles that you end up controlling. In this case, actually, um, it's just uh, six, I think, is the, they control the position, not the angles. So um, it's, a, it's relatively low dimension. So if that makes sense, everybody's still hearing me okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, and Dave, feel, yeah, feel free to, um, to jump in uh, if I misstate anything through here on the diffusion stuff. But basically the idea is diffusion in, in low uh, dimensions. We're gonna try to figure out, so this is represented two dimensional space. Um, and it, this is the topo lines are representing uh, a, a, the P of X, the probability density of the data. Um, and in this case, these the score function that we end up learning all points to, to the um, high density uh, areas within the, the space, control space. So that during, this is a little animation if that comes through okay, during um, inference, what we do is we start with um, a gal, a, a, a distribution in general, Gaussian distribution. So you can see the little blue dots are everywhere. Um, and then we use a process where we follow uh, that score function um, and migrate towards these, um, the samples migrate towards these locations of higher probability. Um, the one that I remembered seeing was this Swiss roll where um, this Swiss roll structure is where the high probability for the, the data is. Um, and you can see kind of with these arrows, if the resolution's working okay, you can see the um, score function, that, which has learned the gradient of the probability density function. Um, it's pointing towards these areas of high density. So when you do inference in this, same type of thing, that you start with a, a large distribution um, and, or a random distribution, and then you 
follow. I don't know how to say the word. What's the dynamics, Dave? What do you call it? Langevin dynamics. Langevin dynamics. Okay. You follow Langevin dynamics to essentially follow this, this um, score function of the gradient of the probability um, to get all the data points in the area of high um, probability. And this, hey. oh, go ahead, somebody. Uh, Roger, can I just jump in with two things real quick? Absolutely. So one, um, it doesn't really conceptually change things much, but I've heard you say the gradient of the probability distribution, and it's technically the gradient of the log probability distribution, but yep. bigger numbers are gonna have bigger logs, so it's pretty similar anyway, but just mathematically, it's there's a log in there. Yep, and you. then also, just if people are watching these really pretty animations, uh, for a lot of applications, you might only want one sample. So you would only have one blue dot, and it would randomly move to just a point, which would be sampled from the probability distribution. But by having however many, 100 points, then you get to see the high density distribution. You get to see, in fact, that it is like a little Swiss rolly thing or whatever. The other one had two sort of, uh, in two corners, it had high probability. It was like two Gaussians or whatever. So just in case people were wondering about the, why there's all these blue dots, right? It's just, so you get a better picture of where's high and low probability. Um, you can sample multiple if that's what you want, but you could in an application like image generation, you might be sampling only one at a time. Thank you for both those clarifications, yeah. So this, um, if I'm thinking about it correctly and, and um, jump in if, if I'm not, um, this idea that I'm getting these points that are landing on um, you know, this, I guess, manifold or whatever of, de of high density, um, I think of this as we're gonna learn um, essentially a, the dimensionality is gonna be in the action space, like what are the, where's the robot supposed to move to? And then it's actually gonna be a number of those points. Um, so it's gonna be a, um, a series of those, those points. They'll start as just kind of um, random actions and then we'll migrate them to this, uh, to these, you know, these high probability areas. And I guess it's, well, I was actually thinking of it as kind of along this line. It's probably not the right space way to think of it. Um, we're gonna end up with a series of points, um, a series of actions. So um, in a sense, the way this is representing it, um, the entire sequence of actions would be a, a higher dimension space. It's not just, even though each point is just two dimensions, um, I suppose that the, the um, result is the entire sequence. So it's higher dimension than this. So I guess not... one. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Oh, uh, just going to add that uh, in terms of the actions, it is a time series in some sense. So it's, you know, one image after another to the next. So while this is trying to identify the, uh, the location for your distribution uh, for a single image, which is the spiral. I don't think this one is the time series part that you're referring to in a robot, of course. And I, I and that's the abstract that I read uh, for this paper. So the action that needs to be taken after each you know, state that the robot is in. So it has to, again, probably figure out you know, what is the next step. And the next step will assumingly depend on where the gradients uh of the score uh distribution take you yeah but so that's that's along the lines of what i was going to comment on so the two diagrams that we're seeing right now are some probability distribution okay this one has high density around the spiral previous one just had high density kind of at two corners it looked sort of gaussian and you can see that not all of the blue dots wind up on exactly the spiral because the spiral is high probability, but it's not like it's zero everywhere else. It's just lower probability, right? So what you're seeing when you see these, let's say, call it a hundred dots, um, uh, when they sort of coalesce towards the end of the animation, that's the unconditional distribution, okay? You can imagine in this diagram, if lower left was cats and upper right was dogs, you could say, I only want a cat. And all the points, even the ones that started in the far upper right, are gonna migrate their way to the lower left corner. 
So in the case of the robot, what they've said, it is now going to be conditioned on the time series data of the last whatever five images, the last six actions. I, I can't remember exactly what the, what the paper said. But um, so what we're seeing in a nice low dimensional 2D animation is the unconditional distribution. But ultimately, we're going to build a slightly more fancy conditional version. Right. Okay, let's um, let's go on then. Um, if there's no more questions there. Um, so this is kind of the, the copy of the the um, abstract of the paper. So um, diffusion policy. It's a um, generating robot behavior by representing a robot's visual motor policy as a conditional denoising diffusion process. Diffusion policy learns the gradient of the action distribution score function and iteratively optimizes with respect to this gradient field during inference via a series of stochastic longevity dynamic steps. Okay. It's actually a, the gradient of the action distribution, right? The score, which we call the score function, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah so in this case, the distribution corresponds to the action. Right. Uh, versus in an image, it corresponds to the pixels uh, distribution, if you may. So I think that's what it is trying to distinguish. That yes, it is a score function of the uh, distribution, but corresponding to the uh, uh, action and not the images as we are used to from right. uh, Yang Song's work. It's but the score function represents the gradient of the action distribution, right? Uh, correct. That's in this case. Yeah, it just the way it reads there. It was gradient apl gradient applies to the action distribution, not the score function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so so sorry, just a real quick check here. So Dave, if we're splitting hairs, the score function is already the gradient right. of the log distribution. So technically, it shouldn't say the gradient unless they really mean the gradient of the gradient. I don't yeah, think I they think mean they that. Did. I cut, I copied and pasted here, but. Um, I don't. Yeah. So, so I, I in the in the basic stuff over. we've seen previously, it's learning the score function, and that score function itself is a gradient, and it's not the gradient of the score function. Right. Right. And the gradient of the gradient would uh, go towards the Fisher information, and then basically leverage the Fisher divergence, which also is used somewhere along the way, if I remember correctly from some of the discussions, but uh, but you're right on, on the actual definition. Uh, I don't know what the, I did not read the paper before this meeting, so I don't know what they actually meant. So Roger, you did copy the abstract correctly. Yeah, yeah, so the abstract just reads a little ambiguous yeah. there. Now, now, one could say that we are learning the score function by using gradient descent. So you actually are using the gradient of the score function in order to learn it. But I, I don't, I don't know. I I think this is standard diffusion stuff. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it just uh, the wording is just to be clear. It's the gradient of the action distribution. The score function actually represents the gradient of the action distribution. So log action distribution. Okay, um, so, and then the, the key thing here is that they, they go through, they, they try this, and we'll look at the architecture a little bit here in a moment. Um, they run in, uh, against 12 different tasks. Um, they have several different benchmarks that they use, and then they also have some data that they collect themselves, um, and they claim an average improvement of 46% um, for successful completion of the tasks over the existing uh, state-of-the-art methods. Um, their claim um, is that the fusion model, it seems like the strongest one is, it's two strongest one is that it handles multimodal action distributions well. Um, some of the other uh, implementations don't do that. So that's like if, um, you know, if I'm gonna do, I can either go around the left side of the tree or the right side of the tree. Um, this handles both of those. If I could choose a right or a left path, it handles those those well. Um, and then also it's um, it's stable, uh, more stable for training. Um, 
because of it, whoops, because it's using that the um, diffusion process. Uh, the, the, the gen, say that again, Dave. Genvin. Langevin. Langevin, like it looks. Okay. <laughs> um, it uh, because of that approach that it's um, it's stable during training. You don't have to estimate um, the denominator and the probability uh, function. Yeah, um, and just wanted to add on this multimodal. You know, when I first read it, uh, without the context that you provided, I thought multimodal meant here instructions being spoken to it versus, versus it seeing as well. You know, different modes of inputs, but in this case, it's the distribution of the of the actions, basically the probability distribution. So multiple modes, which is what is shown in your other picture as well, the first picture. Right. So, yeah. Um, okay, and then their uh, technical contribu uh, contributions that they claim are this receding horizon control, interesting, the visual conditioning, and this time series diffusion transformer. We'll try to touch on each of those, so. Um, and I want to reiterate, we got a lot of new people on, um, you know, feel free to interrupt. We, we all learn best when this is a more interactive, dynamic uh, conversation. So um, if you have any questions um, or any suggestions, uh, clarifications, feel free to speak up. Okay. Um, this paper or this one slide I thought caught, captured the majority of, of what this paper is about. Um, so I wanted to go through this just briefly first. But the, the idea is that we're going to take some sort of observation space. Now, they will do a state space version and a, a um, vision-based uh, approach. So they'll test it both ways. Um, but kind of ideally, you're thinking of an, uh, an image system, a vision-based system, um, you also, your observations would include things like where is, you know, what's the pose of the robot? Where am I right now? <clears throat> they will take those observations. They will capture some number of those. Um, and then they will run it through a diffusion policy. This is much like we've seen um, diffusion before, where they'll start with a, an action space, a sequence of ac actions that's more or less um, random, a, a Gaussian distribution. And then they'll iterate K times on that. Um, to make it um, a highly probable uh, sequence of actions given the conditioning on this original um, image observation. Um, <clears throat> that sequence then, they, they will actually, so they, it's interesting, they, they will take the observation now and they will predict the next n steps um, without further, without paying attention to further observations. Now they'll then only execute some number of those and they claim in the paper that it's because of performance really. They'll execute some number of those um, and then they'll take another set of observations and start the cycle again. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of observe, create a plan and then drive blind for a little bit is the way I got it. I don't know if anybody else that read the paper got it differently, but that's what I saw. And it, the motivation for generating a sequence was partly to get temporally con, um, consistent actions, but it also seemed like it was because of the performance issue, the latency on this uh, diffusion inference. Hey, Roger, uh, I don't know if you saw my hand raised, but uh, oh, no way. So it could be, as you said, you know, one is performance in terms of trying to predict the action after every step. So that could be prohibitive. Uh, also, I think, as you mentioned, trying to, like it's six degrees of freedom, right? So essentially trying to predict after every observation may definitely be compute and, uh, you know, time prohibitive. Uh, but, or, or maybe their objective was to get a better result with less. So, and it worked that way with, with a series of actions. But I think the other thing is also, uh, you mentioned that, you know, once the action plan is determined, then for the temporal and spatial uh, uh, proximities, you know, for the duration for or whatever is the step size or, or the, the number of actions here, you know, it's hopefully supposed to not keep flip-flopping after every, every uh, action. So there could be multiple of those reasons to kind of reinforce that, but 
uh, I mean, that's what I gathered from what you're saying. And is, is, is my paraphrasing, does that make sense in, in the context? Yeah, I think generating a sequence um, does stops the or helps prevent the flip flopping. Um, I think that the primary motivation was time. I, I think they said somewhere uh, on a 3080 they control this this six degree of um, freedom robot on um, at about 10 hertz. I think it was, um, and that's with this you know with these gaps in between. So I see. Anyhow, um, so we predict the actions and then they roll out the action. So these pictures over on the left, they're kind of, sh the color indicates uh, the kind of the time dimension of the sequence. Um, and so this is the motion that it plans to execute. This is a 2D model. We're looking at it. It's the push T um, example that they're, or um, whatever challenge um, that they're trying to do. And so you can see it's initially going to do this, and later on it's planning to move over there. Um, and it starts, I guess we can see here where it starts with these ran, you know, this random set of points, and then it gradually refines them down to be, okay, this is the real path that I want. And that's, it's basically that refining is, is simply following uh, this score function based on the training data that it had. Um, they do in here, use two different um, uh, score functions, this E theta. Um, one is CNN based and one is transformer based. In the CNN, I hadn't heard of this before, film they do <clears throat> feature wise linear modulation. So it, each layer in this CNN with the features that come out of the CNN, you can see there's a A and B um, coefficients that are or parameters that are generated out of the observations through a linear projection, um, those then modulate the features at each layer. Um, and there's multiple of, of those in there. I don't know how deep this, I think they said ResNet 18, so there'd been 18 the, these layers. That's the CNN base. They said this actually works fairly well. Um, this K here would represent, I, <clears throat> I generate the action um, and I estimate the, the gradient and I do update the action and then I do this k times. So you're looping around this k times. The second model that they used was a um, transformer-like model. Um, in here they have, they take the observations and they embed them. Um, they also take the actions, uh, the previous actions and embed those. Um, and I'm not quite sure they show the embedding actions here and here. Um, it, I think they're, they're talking about this as, as a um, special type of transformer. What, what was their claim? They called it a time series diffusion transformer. <clears throat> um, I think the point is that they have attention enabled for the observation at every step of this, um, this trajectory, and they only are allow attention back to the the previous n um, uh, actions as they're generating each action. So this is kind of like the, the mask that we would see in a, a language model. Okay, um, that is kind of, that's the whole architecture, that's what they're talking about doing. Um, and then what they claim, this is the claim is that um, this thing behaves better than the other models that they're looking at. Um, so this is the diffusion policy. You can see that it's fairly stable. It needs to push the T this way. Um, and uh, it can go either side to do that. Um, IBC was um, imitation behavior cloning, I think. Um, and the primary argument they made against this was that it's biased to just one side. So it, it doesn't ma model the multi-model very, uh, very well. Behavior transformer. Um, this was another one. It sounded, if I understood this right, and jump in if I got this wrong, Ted or, or Dave. Um, this one, it's similar to the diffusion policy, but it it is, um, you, it's not as stable training. Um, and I think they kind of believe that that was because 
in here you're actually looking at the uh, probability um, density function and you have to in order to get that you got that denominator underneath to divide by um, and so you're having to run a bunch of negative samples to try to figure out um, where this uh, policy is low essentially um, and that pr introduces instability during training um, I, there'll be a slide in the a picture in the paper we can look at that kind of tries to capture that, but that's what I got. And then the LSTM, this is, I think, representing what they call implicit behavior. So um, in this one, you're not modeling the probability of the action. Um, you're taking the input state and predicting the action directly. Okay. So the, the end result is diffusion policy kind of... Um, gets it's the best of all worlds here any questions or anybody got comments on that what is the dash gmm for um gaussian mixture model i believe huh. so they're trying to make it multimodal and I, I don't i can't quite tell i think this might have been a, another mode but it it tended to bias strongly towards one side Hmm. So, so Roger, I was not able to give the paper a deep read, but it seems to me that what they're saying in this figure four is that this particular model, the diffusion one, uh, recognizes that you could go clockwise or counterclockwise, and when you're starting at the exact opposite from where you need to be on the other side of the T, it's kind of, you can see the distributions are 50-50, which way it goes mm -hmm. but somehow by including in the inputs the last few actions that once you start moving let's say you know to the left to go the what is that counterclockwise way it's going to know hey my last few actions were moved slightly to the left and so part of the training it learns to be consistent and says well there's a whatever, 40% chance I could go clockwise, but once I've started to commit going to the left, I'm not going to do the thing like BET where I suddenly shift as if I were going to the right and then you get those crazy things going right through the middle like they're not supposed to. Yeah, so, I don't know. I understand what you're saying, and I don't know here. So I didn't quite understand uh, Prediction Horizon. I'm not sure. This isn't showing the actions, previous actions, as input into this diffusion. Oh, well, no, it's right there, isn't it? So, so yeah. no, it, it, it may not, it may or may not explicitly include them, but even if it doesn't, it certainly includes the observations that show, hey, my robot yes. hand was a little to the right a couple time steps ago, so I'm, I apparently am moving towards the left. So whichever way they get it, either directly or indirectly, right? it's not just looking at the most recent info it's right. got a little bit of history and so they didn't explicitly put some inductive bias that says don't reverse your course i think the thing just learned to be smart and in general somewhere you know in the score function it, it says reversing your course isn't isn't really a good idea right right yeah that'd be interesting um i don't i think you're probably right what i don't know is um you know, could you have fixed the other approaches by giving them a little history um, to set the dimension? The way they yeah. described it, like the L LSTM, um, I think diffusion policy is predicting the entire sequence up front. Um, I'm not sure if these other ones were doing the same. I didn't. I didn't get that out of it. Yeah, I mean. It's not predicting like the whole whole sequence. It's only predicting up to some small number of time steps yeah, in the future. Yeah. But I think what the score function, I don't know what to call it, the score function universe that it learns is based on the whole all the steps that it needs to take, right? The score function is not just based on early steps that it needs to take. It, 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 so 
yeah. think that's what they're trying to draw upon is is that it kind of understands the whole thing, even if you're only predicting a little bit in yeah. the moment. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's just like when you're doing diffusion to make a um, a picture, okay? When you're doing coarse features, it might say eyes are going to go here and nose is going to go there. And it knows that eventually, you know, you're going to have whatever, you know, the whites of the eyes, the iris of the eyes, the pupils of the eyes. It's not at this point filling in those details, but, you know, somewhere baked into the model, it knows those things. And it knows the eyes should be similar size, depending on your pose, they should be symmetric, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So. So I feel like if it can kind of know those things for generating a picture, it can kind of know those things about like, hey, if you're trying to get from this point to that point in order to push something, then like, even though it's not making those predictions, it's sort of conscious of the the bigger world in which it's living in. Yeah. So, so I, I, yeah, I saw Dave, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I just posted a link from the paper if you want to open that up and we can go through that. Um, yeah, I, a link or I saw that the... Uh, the I copied the text from... Section you copied the text, section. yeah. So so basically it it is that the other models would struggle to predict the sequence of actions in the same fashion for different reasons, right? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and their reasoning is, like in the second paragraph, uh, they kind of reason the same way how diffusion excels for images as well in the high output dimensions. Uh, in some sense, without talking about the sequence specifically, you know, they are drawing upon the success of diffusion and those high dimension uh, expressiveness of the model uh, as the reason for why uh, benefit you know action sequence is benefiting this versus uh the others are actually it's clearly mentions that they even avoid because uh expressing leveraging the samples uh, effectively is a concern yeah and they do highlight ibc bc rnn which i'm assuming is the same as lstm gnn or similar to that and bet the behavior transformer uh, so that kind of gets back to the comment you made earlier that um, this saves compute power by predicting the sequence and then just following the sequence it kind of to me feels like there's a little bit of missed opportunity to check it e at each step but having predicting a sequence allows you to to um, uh, in this case for instance commit to one side or another um, it allows it to be a smoother transition. So. That's a good point, yeah. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, the uh, And this is the website then, Diffusion Policy CS Columbia.edu. Um, and it's kind of funny that they, I thought that they had this example because they are going to talk about um, multiple different approaches to policy, um, but they, they kind of start with, the one on the right is the one that we're actually, that they've come up with, that they're going to be running. They're contrasting, I guess, with an explicit policy that just takes in the observations and spits out a distribution of actions, um, an implicit policy that takes the observation. And I'm not quite sure, I think this action is meaning that, I'm not quite sure what this action in represents, but um, they have this energy, which is kind of this probability, similar to what we're doing. This is kind of the, if I understood it correctly, is kind of the, um, probability density function, whereas we're just computing the, the um, gradient of the, or estimating the gradient of the probability density. And that's why um, this one is more stable than the one in the middle. But the one on the right is the one that they're actually presenting. You can see, not sure what this particular distribution is, but you can see the gradients kind of like what we've seen before. Uh, and you can see the iterative process for inference here where um, we're updating the our action based on uh, the gradient, or the, the score function rather. Um, we, I tried to already uh, copy and paste that sufficiently. So we've already been kind of through that. This is the, the um, comparison with other approaches. And here we get some movies in here. So 
um, the idea is up in here is kind of the one we saw before where it's it's taking the observation its goal is to move um, that t in this example into you can kind of see the outline of it um, and then place the the robot controller off to the side so you can see the the end result um, the points again color represents where it is in the time sequence uh, it'll execute the first as it turns out four of those um, and then take another observation and compute through diffusion inference again the, the trajectory by doing that um, every what is it half a second or something like that um, it allows it then to be responsive to things not going right so um, when one of the operators goes in and uses a stick to move the T um, it can kind of update and and correct for that um, when When it, it becomes occluded for some reason, um, again, it can update its policy. Think for some reason, this, this model learning this way um, is um, fairly good at actions that are long, um, long time frame. So it's got to do position the T first and then move out of the way. Uh, and that apparently is something that some of the other models tended to struggle with. Are we doing okay? Can you hear me all right? I hear any loud and clear. Okay, good. I got an internet is unstable message, so I was worried. Okay, some of the other actions then, um, these are ones that they're doing in real life. Uh, mug flipping is just to find the mug and put it upside down. Um, I don't know if it's always, I didn't check. It looks like it might always be in the same location. Um, that was actually an interesting thing in the T example that I found is, they sketch that little goal for the T. Um, and my assumption was that it would be that sketch established the goal for the T, but it's actually in all examples that they did, it's the same goal location. Um, and I tried this on the code as well. Um, so it, it is hard coded for a specific location. It'd be interesting to see if you condition the action um, on the goal location and uh, you know, if it would be more robust, well, actually, if it would work with different goal locations, but as so in the, the release code won't do that. So in the case of the pizza, right, they are perturbing it. So they are moving it around. So the it is able to identify the moving goal in that case. Yeah, they talked about it differently there. And so I don't, um, the one, the code that I was looking through was primarily, they provide at the bottom of this website, they provide two collabs, one for state, policy and one for vision policy. And I was playing with those. Both had problems, by the way, if anybody's interested in playing with it, I'll share my my updates that made it so you can run. Um, I didn't get to look at the code for, I would have thought the code was the same, um, but it might've just been the environment for T didn't have it moving around. Um, they do have um, what you're talking about where the, the, they're moving the, the pie in the, while it's being spread. They do move the T around, but it always tries to put it in the same location. So yeah, I guess those are kind of two different things. One, it, one, it still does the, spreads the sauce correctly, isn't it? Even when it moves. That's right. So that's where the action, uh, I think the, based on the observations, new observations, it's adjusting the trajectory. Yeah. So I would, I would, I was hoping to to run that test. I still might do that. Um, my guess then would be that um, adding the the pose for the the T as a target um, that that would that would train um, up successfully and do like the the pizza does as well. Yeah. See if you can change the sketch for where it has to put T. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give that a shot. I won't do it with the physical robot, but I will. I can try it with the, they have like a 2D model that they use in the um, collab. I see. Um, anyhow, uh, I thought the pizza sauce one was pretty impressive because you're dealing with, you know, not a rigid object when they're doing that. And I, maybe it, maybe that particular task is fairly tolerant, but um, it's pretty impressive that you could, um, you know, get that spreading to work like that. Mm. So. It's, it's also... 
very relevant to current economics. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. And the thing here is all of these um, examples, whether you're talking about the physical examples, they have a program that you saw in the first video where somebody was like telemanipulating the, the robot. So it's a physical robot. I've got, I think they call it a space mouse. I'm moving my space mouse around to move the robot to achieve the task. They're recording the video and they're recording all of the, the robot position information. And then they train that diffusion policy on that data set. So I think if I recall, it was like on the order of 200 examples that they were using. So these things are learning from human behavior, human example. Um, and, and then once they got that, then they train it um, on either the state or really what you want is to train it on the, the video system, image system. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing was they tapped into, so I, my belief is that these examples here are the ones that they actually did in their little Toyota lab or wherever it was. These down here are simulation benchmarks are ones that other people have created. Um, the one that I was, that this push T in the middle here, this is the one that shows up on your collab that you can play with. You can train a policy on. Uh, it's pretty quick. I did it uh, for the state. I haven't done it for image yet. Um, and then these other ones are running in um, 3D VR systems um, with physics. Um, one of the things I found, and, and I think each of these, so implicit, so lift one, robo mimic uh, environment is used for those top ones and uh, the first one on the bottom row. Um, then there was this push T is from the imid, implicit behavior I misstated that earlier, implicit behavior cloning paper for these. Um, this is, uses a 2D package um, for rendering Pygame and uh, PyMonk, I think it was called for the 2D physics. I'm not quite sure exactly which environment this three behavior transformer used, but it, it might me, be the same as, as um, the first one and the last one, the Franca Kitchen. Um, those are all, all using Mujoko, um, if I'm saying that right. Um, that was an environment that we've seen a lot when been, when playing with re reinforcement learning. Um, when you're dealing with 3D types of things, there's a lot of papers that use Mujoko. But it was a private um, for-pay uh, 3D physics simulation. Uh, but it turns out that uh, DeepMind purchased, um, where did I? see that somewhere I had it here that DeepMind purchased um, Mujoko and has open sourced it. So yeah. So it's now, <clears throat> this is now October 21 and open sourced in 22. So this is pretty cool. Um, if anybody's interested in, in like robot and 3D simulations, um, this has been kind of the standard, it seems to me. And that's where I've always seen the um, them using for the simulation. And now we, we have access to that. So that's cool. Um, RoboMimic was, um, is a framework for mimicking behavior. So they have a bunch of recorded uh, behaviors. Um, they have, uh, what was it, uh, RoboTurk, I think they had set up. So the idea that you could do that human manipulation um, in kind of a Turk style where, you know, your people crowdsource it on the internet run this, the simulations, uh, and then you have the data set with the images and the, the um, uh, all the angles and everything like that. Franca Kitchen's similar from what I gather. Um, it has a, a environment that's more targeted towards uh, kitchen work, I guess. Um, so, okay, let's see. And by the way, they talk about in the paper being able to go from these simulated environments by doing a lot of um, randomization of the environment, which I think is mostly like colors, textures, point of view, that type of thing. Um, and they're able to then make it transferable to where they can do zero shot uh, in the physical world. So that's pretty cool too. Any questions? I think that's just about the end of the website here. They do have a GitHub with all the the um, code and they have a folder with um, the data, raw data that they've collected, and then two notebooks, a 
um, they implement this um, push T in a state version and also in a vision version. Okay. If there's no questions then. Um, Roger, are you going to cover the training uh, time and infrastructure for this? Um, I don't think I called that out specifically. I'm going to um, run out of time is what I'm going to do. Um, 7.30 already. So if, if that's one you want to explicitly um, bring up, why don't you mention it as we scroll through? And uh, we can we can we can cover that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, you know, once we reach there. Yeah. Sure. So I think again, we this will be kind of our second or third time through, but um, we've already covered the abstract and the images and everything. Um, these multimodal distributions, sequence correlation, we talked about those. Um, I'm not quite sure high precision how that fits in, but um, they. This is the. Um, this is key properties that they're saying that the diffusion model is, is strong at. Um, these arbitrary distributions, um, which help support the uh, multimodal. Uh, high dimensional output, I guess this is that generating a sequence of actions instead of just single stepping like the other ones do. Uh, and then it seems to be stable. And I think here's where they talk about training the energy based, which would be this center one, this implicit policy um is um intractable because of the the uh, normalization constant that you have to work up uh, figure out so it makes it less stable um, the contributions here is um this this idea of this receding horizon control um so where they plan some number of steps, n steps, and then they execute. Like they'll plan eight steps and then execute four, even though that it may be a 200 step uh, task to get all the way through. Uh, visual conditioning of this <clears throat> generation. And then we already saw the uh, time series uh, diffusion transformer. 12 tasks, four different benchmarks, 46% improvement. This is just the standard um, uh, denoising diffusion uh, models that we've been looking at. Um, so I don't know that I'll go through, but it's there's really it's just like all the image um, generation that we've been doing on other ones in the last few weeks. Uh, I think we covered all of this. Talked about everything in here. Were there any? Hey, Roger. Would yeah. you mind scrolling up to the training for just a second? Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is something I can't remember if it was this meetup or a different meetup. I think Dave, it might have actually been uh, Mike's meetup that's on Tuesdays now. But do you see where it says? We have our, our unnoised X sub X super zero. Yep. Okay. And we sample a random noise epsilon super K. Yep. Um, with the appropriate variance that would correspond to if you were doing step by step one, two, three, four, five, the Kth step of noising. Yep. Okay. And I just wanted to clarify that while we think of diffusion either the forward or the backwards process as this iterative step-by-step -step, um process because gaussian um gaussians have this very nice closed form property where you can calculate stuff instead of adding k gaussians you can directly sample from what the sum of K Gaussians would look like. It's just a Gaussian with a higher right. variance, right? right? Right. So so when these models are trained, they are not, tr let's say it's a hundred steps to go from, from pure noise to pure image. They're not trained 
on a on those hundred in a row, you would just take your real data and you would pick a random number between zero and a hundred, and you would train it on, you know, let's say you picked randomly 63, right? You train it on the difference between 63 and 62. And that's it. And right. then the next batch, maybe you rip, you randomly pick 37. So you train it on the difference between 37 and 36 and so on and so forth that you, even though we think of diffusion as this linear process, it does not need to be trained in that way. You can just randomly train it on any point in the. Any step. Yep. Yeah. So, and that, that function, so that's the function that will estimate the noise and the loss function is just the mean squared error between that and the actual noise, right? Right. And then, you know, early on the, the, the steps were all equal size and now people are figuring out like what's the minimum number of steps. And, and so you can take, uh, what is it? When the image is close, has very little noise. I think you can take bigger steps because it's pretty clear. It's like, ah, oh, well, that's just a house with some specs on it. You know, like it's pretty yeah. obvious, like what to do. But when it's at the other end of the spectrum, you have to take smaller steps because it's very unclear what direction you're moving in. Yeah. Now, one thing, I don't think we'll get down into the code this deep, but it might be interesting another time to look at um, how that is supported. Th these guys are using the Hugging Face library, um, diff users. Um, and mm -hmm. you can actually, that whole process that you just described um, is handled by the 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 API essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. I think it is. I just um, it probably wasn't this meetup, so maybe I didn't need to say it. But I just wanted to clarify that uh, you don't have to like train it going from pure noise to clean image or vice versa. Uh, you can just train it on any one random step at a time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right, and and the step is the condition essentially. So K becomes a condition for your uh, right. network because essentially it's the same network that you repeat, but every time during inferencing you are you know using a different step. I so during the actual you know, generation process. So that's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it could could have been here because I know this was mentioned as one of the uh, aspects of. You know, evolution of Yang Song's work, where they use the K as the uh, condition in the in their model. Yeah, but all this stuff is essentially the same stuff they, that you had been presenting before in the, in the last few weeks. It's the exact same thing that we're doing with images. That's correct. That's correct. Our, our Yang song was presenting and we were just paying his <laughs> Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so the idea is still the same, that you have to have some ground truth data, whether the ground truth data is a dog picture or the ground truth is what the robot sees plus the last four whatever, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it, it's still just a bunch of numbers, right? Yeah. And so... Our case, um, it's all... Um, I, th I think all the examples that they talk about, it's all human generated examples. So, Right. But I'm saying you take that example and you noise it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and then thereby you train a neural network to be able to predict, imitate, whatever you want to call it, mimic the score function of that probability distribution. Yep. Okay. Any other points there, Ted? Are we done there? No, sorry. I just oh, that's okay. I, I was just remembering that conversation where um I can't remember. It might have been Mike in the other meetup, but where it seemed like they were kind of stuck on the fact that we we think of this as this iterative diffusion process, but just because we think of it that way it doesn't mean you have to actually yeah build your batches with consecutive time steps. Right. Okay, um, let's see, this actually is the code. You guys can see the cursor, right? Yeah, we yeah. see your arrow. Okay, so this this is um, actually where they talked about, um, they use the the DDPMs that are used for image generation. They make the modifications to output the actions, which, you know, it's just a set of numbers. 
uh, and then they come up with this way to do conditioning. Um, uh, image systems are also conditioned. I don't know if they do it exactly the same way. It didn't sound like this film approach um, was something they invented. So I would assume that there, there's other examples where um, diffusion is, is using a CNN uh, and has you know some sort of conditioning um, on it. Um, right, and they do refer to that. And when you go, you see that CNN based diffusion policy, that number 21. Uh, they do refer to that in that section, right below, yeah. Okay, so um, here they talk about, yeah, there's an observation. These are kind of abstract. The examples they use, I think, are a little more specific, but T0 is an observation horizon. How many images, or how many observations you are you basing your um, uh, score function on? Um, the action prediction horizon and the uh, TP and TA is the action execution horizon. I'm not quite sure why TP would be, why you'd predict beyond where you're actually going to do, um, unless that's maybe helps with the training or something. I don't know. Um, well, yeah, this encourages temporal action consistency while remaining responsive. Interesting. So the TA, that the size of the execution horizon is related to um, how how long between intervals. I'll take a peek and then I'll do a certain number of actions without looking at the observations, then I'll do it again. I guess if it learns, it can learn the actions that it would be doing um, beyond that uh, because it would be available in the training data. So it, that prediction maybe ties ties it together and you know helps encourage this uh, temporal consistency. Yeah, I agree. I think that's kind of a really interesting uh design decision. Yeah. OK, um, this is another one it, where they're doing, if I'm understanding this correctly, so they're conditioning the actions on the observation rather than trying to figure out the joint distribution of the actions and observations, which basically they're not going to predict. They talk about not predicting the observations for the after you know, the specific, specific actions. Um, they're just projecting actions forward from a, um, the observation at time t um, and uh, not not without the cost of inferring future states that speeds it up and works good enough i guess significantly improves inference speed and better accommodates real-time control so that's that go blind predict a sequence then go blind <clears throat> Uh, two, two models we already looked at, CNN, uh, I don't think. Uh, this was interesting. In, in practice, we found CNN-based backbone to work well on most tasks out of the box without the need for much hyperparameter tuning. However, it performs poorly when then the action sequence changes quickly. Um, and then in those cases, the, these time series um, diffusion transformers seem to work better. Um, I think we already kind of talked about this. This is just in words that transformer block, um, how it works. You pass in the actions, um, include the sinusoidal embedding, which I don't think I pointed out, but that was uh, added to the conditioning. Um, they only did it for the observation time for the first token, not for every token. So they didn't embed it in, um, in each token. They just embedded it into the uh, conditioning. Uh, Can I ask a random question? Sure. Um, it looks like you did some sort of markup on the PDF so that you've got the uh, yellow and red highlighters. Yeah. Uh, how did you do that? Um, I just used um, the, this is the Acrobat, downloaded Acrobat, um, and it has a comment mode. Okay, cool. Um, I used to use something called GoodNotes on my iPad, but it wouldn't, I couldn't transfer it to uh, my Windows machine. So yeah, that's what I'm using now for notes. Other people I think have had other PDF viewers that they use, but that's the one I'm using now. Thank you. Hi, Roger. Yeah. Uh, if you go back to the previous page and on the CNN based diffusion policy, yep. I thought one uh, comment that was pretty uh, helpful. So in uh, the, the highlighted one, uh, did you already read through that? Because I've been flip-flopping between your... This uh, one down here? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I read through most of that. Yeah, that it works pretty good. Uh, they actually say they recommend start with the CNN base. If that doesn't work, then try the transformer. Right, and it doesn't work in the cases where there are sharp changes in the distribution. Yeah, I didn't understand this inductive bias of temporal convolutions to prefer low frequency signals. I didn't I didn't follow the link, so I don't know uh, the citation. I don't know why that would be the case, but. So CNNs uh, would have bias towards uh, high frequency detection because of the window, right? As such in general, uh, it depends on, you know, the layer of course. Uh, so, yeah, it would be good to understand that uh, they have a reference here, 49, yeah. so. Yep. Which is FUIA features let networks learn high frequency functions in low dimension domains. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can later on pick okay, that so, up. So I have a question about that. Do we know how they arranged the data when they fed it into the CNN? Um, I think we do. Um, it was um, it, it, because it goes through an embedding. Um, the act, so I mean, they arrange it as a sequence of actions. Oh, but the oh, actions it's the actions. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> so the observations don't go through the CNN? Uh, they do through across th this film, this feature-wise linear modulation. But, but they, they don't go through them. actual convolutions. No, they go through, well, okay, yes and no, but that's not the, C the CNN that they're talking about. So when you do images, they use like a ResNet 18 um, that they send it through. What's really interesting, um, oh, where did they go? On the paper. Um, yeah, they, they, the visual encoder um, goes through into a latent embedding. Um, but what's interesting is they use a ResNet 18, nice common architecture, but they don't use the pre-training. They, they actually tried pre-training and it didn't work as well. So they use a ResNet 18 and they train it um, end to end. Okay. So my, my question in terms of ranging the data is if you want to show me the last five time steps from the camera, how exactly does it work? You pass each camera time step through the res the vanilla ResNet and you get out the bottleneck embedding and then you concatenate them? Like, I'm just trying to figure out when it yeah, says yeah, I don't... temporal convolutions, what does that mean? I would think observation OT. Because didn't I think they say it's based on more than just one observation? Like it they is. Give they, use an arbitrary, they use an arbitrary one here. The example I saw that the push T was two observations. Yeah. Um, so they're able to figure out, you know, velocities and stuff like that, presumably. Um, but I, I would guess that they're running um, the, uh, the images, would, the visual system, they'd run the images through the ResNet and then the you know, that top layer of the ResNet would run into um, either an embedding if you're using a transformer or through this linear projection. Right. So that would imply says, that if you use two, you just yeah, this is, yeah. Yeah, that's, I would have thought this image would have said, oh, T through T plus T minus one or something like that. Right. That, that's what I'm trying to get at. So when they talk about the temporal convolutions and high versus low frequency, I can't even form an opinion as to whether it would be high or low frequency because I don't even know what data they're talking about and what convolution they're talking about. My, since they're talking about it in the context of the CNN-based um, score network, my expectation is it's high frequency in the action space that you're generating. 
And at the bottom, it still just says A sub T. It's not a sequence of them. It's not a concatenation of them. Yeah, I I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's sloppy notation because this, if you look at this cross attention masking. No, they have this times K, right? So it's repeating K times. Uh, and then K, K times, right. No, the K is the diffusion. Right, that's the, yeah, the inference. Ah, okay, yeah. That's right, yeah, K is the diffusion. Okay, so. Time check, uh, Roger, so it's 7.53. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so what do we want to do? There's more in the paper I could try to get through. I want, I, there was one exciting thing that I wanted to, I, I found exciting at least, um, I wanted to look at. Yeah, you said you wanted to skip to the end for something. Yeah, yeah. So let let's. Um, okay, which way do we want to go? Um, I can just scratch this. We can do this later. It the the thing that was interesting, I thought, is in the ideal system. And here, th this is an example. They're using this as an example of how to capture um, human demonstrations of a process, a task in the robotic space and vision space, um, and then creating this um, diffusion policy that robustly executes that, right? Um, in the ideal world, to me, it seems like you're going to want to be able to say something like, would you put that packet in the mailbox? Um, and somehow that textual description conditions the action um, and uh, it then uses the images and knowledge of where the uh, however you say that word is knowledge of where, you know, all the internal state of the robot. Um, it uses all that to create a policy that then does what you want to do. Um, this, I happened to stumble across a site that is scaling up and distilling down where essentially they're approaching this by um, using the language model to, and the, the virtual reality or the VR systems or uh, f uh, physics simulation systems to create a whole bunch of data doing what you want to do. They'll train the diffusion model and then use the diffusion model for zero shot um, in, uh, execution of that task. Um, interesting this, next step. So this sounds pretty cool, Roger. If, you, if you're open to it, I, I think we could continue and talk about these, these things again next week. Okay. I Yeah, I haven't really read through, but um, it, so it might be a shorter one. I don't know. But yeah, I, I'd be happy to do it next week. But also, uh, we haven't even touched your uh, code notebooks. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's just wrap up the paper today. Okay. Um, oh, one, one other thing. Is there a link to the paper? Yeah, uh, that should be um in the top of the the meetup chat the zoom chat as well as in the agenda um, channel on the the uh, slack i'll put it in the chat again yep. ah, there it is. so let me wrap this up and then um dave there was some place that you wanted to dive into uh, what was like training time and stuff like that right yeah, if you're doing the code uh, coverage next week, you know, we can as well cover it next week. That's okay. 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 Uh, okay. So that was the thing that stood out for me. Um, I'm kind of surprised that they get the whole ResNet training as part of the training process. I'm really surprised that that works better. Um, and I'm wondering if it's got to do with this, some of the changes that they make where maybe they're breaking, they're replacing global average pooling with spatial softmax pooling, and they're replacing batch norm with group norm. Well, I would think that would break things. It wouldn't be surprised if that broke things and maybe that makes the pre-train not work. I don't know. Any thoughts? That seems like a reasonable in, in, um, intuition because I've seen stuff where, like if you're gonna use something for a completely different data, completely different application, 
pre-trained still works better because it just seems to be a a that that whatever the the, the lottery hypothesis it's like right. a good, you know oh, better sure. randomization right yep. yep um so you would think that's generally true but if you're changing stuff like that then maybe uh it throws that out the window because maybe it's no longer really well distributed between like negative one and one or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, here's the one comment, um, Dave, talking about performance. They talk about um, 100 training iterations. So it's just 100 data, I guess. Um, 10 inference iterations enables 0.1 second inference latency on a 3080. That doesn't talk about the whole wall clock time for training, but that 0.1 seconds inference latency on a 3080 for one of these. So is 0.1 second enough for them to do real time? I'm thinking about the pizza sauce thing. You know, what I read somewhere was the robot they're controlling, I think had 120 Hertz um, and a control signal that it was looking for and that they put a little layer in between this so they were essentially they were extracting um you know that the trajectory um at that 120 hertz using updates every kind of replanning every 0.1 seconds yeah so then they need like about 12 used predictions each 0.1 second so 0.1 second would would generate um, they use four action steps, so they create a sequence, I think, of eight, and then use four. So now you're down to 0 0.025, so 25 milliseconds. Um, yeah, I'm saying that only gets you to 40 hertz. So right. if it gets 120, you'd need to be predicting 12. Well, predicting however many and using 12. Yeah. Unless they had a faster GPU for the pizza robot. It could also be that they, that's the accelerated video, right? Oftentimes the videos are accelerated. Yeah, not sure. Okay. Yeah, not sure maybe. Specific detail, but... Okay. Diffusion policies, ability to express multimoded distributions uh, naturally and precisely is one of its key advantages. That's kind of a takeaway that I got. Also, they use position control. Um, they found that um, there's an example here where they talk about, let's see this example here. They talk, so this is talking about um, for the task, how much switching from a velocity control to a position control um, affects the performance, the success rate. So in the case of the other two algorithms, LSTM and, and the behavioral transformer, moving to position control hurts it. Um, in the case of the diffusion policy CNN and the transformer, um, it improves it and quite a bit, improves it quite a bit for the CNN version in the kitchen workflow. So anyhow, they there was one place where they talk about it, it because you're doing kind of a predicting a sequence, um, the position control is going to be uh, less sensitive to errors, the noise in the, the control signal, because if you're talking about velocity, you know, it, it integrates it, it accumulates that error. So position is a little bit more uh, precise if you're predicting a longer sequence. Um, and that's why they think it helps um, with the diffusion. <clears throat> diffusion policy represents it in the form of high dimensional action sequence. We talked about this already that Temporal action consistency. Uh, this robustness to idle actions, I didn't quite understand where, um, the dem if the demonstration pauses, um, that that, I guess, is a common problem when you're using the, these demonstrations from humans. Um, it seems like, I don't know, it seems like you could have accommodated that some other way, but they claim that. Why is diffusion appears to be more stable to train? And this is where they talk about um, if you're using the energy-based model, um, then you have this denominator that you have to deal with. 
um, when you're using uh, diffusion uh, models and score function, you don't have to actually compute that that uh, denominator. And apparently, the estimate of that um, denominator is affected by the um, negative. Let's say no, 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 no. Where did they talk about this? They talked said that it was the the negative training. I thought negative sample points. Yeah, it was right up there in the equation. Yeah. In practice, the inaccuracy of the negative sampling is known to cause training instability. And that, so they're estimating that that's why, because that's used to compute uh, the, the denominator. So that's interesting. Um, and here, they, this is where they showed, I think we talked about earlier, the difference um, where the diffusion, the, the blue is um, using diffusion and the the gray was the um, energy based where it just never the training error, error never goes to zero just to, can't stay is not stable training is unstable okay we're out of time um, Dave I don't know if there was that question you had was something did you know where it was? Was there a section? That no, it's not there in the paper. I tried to look in the paper. They mentioned that they're going to release details soon, including the training details. Okay. So, okay. Uh, they have mentioned that several times uh, in the paper. Okay. But the paper was first released in March, and it has been trending really well. Uh, already has around 40 uh, citations. But... All along, they kept saying the code, data, and training details will be publicly available for producing our results. They but, do. I mean, they do have down here, they've got all of the hyperparameters. Oh, um, okay. So they've got some training details. I don't know which ones you're looking for, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just trying to compare it with uh, the amount of data needed and the amount of uh, training power needed as compared to other diffusion training. Yeah. The one that gets me is, is um, what about at the inference time? This seems like it works better um, at inference time, but it also is a lot more expensive, a lot more computationally expensive uh, than the yeah. other, other examples. So I, how suitable it is, I don't know. Like to train stability diffusion and other diffusion process, you know, models, they have like different versions depending on whether they train it on 200 million or, or, or it's half a million, no, sorry, is it 500 million versus 2 billion versus whatever that number is, right? 400 million. I think it's 20 million and 400 million. And those are already very curated uh, samples. And uh, they do end up using a lot of resources to train it versus yeah. the video that you showed earlier talked about being able to leverage this for overnight training yeah right? well i think they only use a few hundred examples this that one showed 100 examples right so 100 human examples and it'll train from that so yeah the, so uh, the data size is much smaller a 64 by 64 image in three colors is like 200,000 dimensional and I don't know if it's predicting a single action at a time, so it's like six dimensional, or if it's, it's yeah, or if it's predicting like five of those, so it's thirty dimensional. But it's it's clearly much smaller. Yeah, 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 yeah. But a clear sense would have been better, like how how much GPU power they ended up using for. Uh, training for each example and so on and so forth, you know, kind of a little bit more clear. Yeah, they yep. kind of included in in the papers as of late, but I didn't see that on this one. So on the flip side, Roger, there's no, well, I don't know what the right intro preposition is, but but they didn't include any training sample code. It was just inference sample code, right? No, no, if you, we didn't look at the repository. Um, but if you um, <clears throat> if you go to the GitHub, um, they have um, th they, these are the data the applications that collect data. Um, they have the full training 
um, in here. In fact, even in the notebooks, you can you can go through a training cycle. And that's it was pretty quick. Do they share any of their training data? Because if it's really that reasonable, we could just run it. I think we can. Um, they have. Uh, let's see if I can. I had at one point that the folder for the actual data. Um, I'm not finding it right this moment. All right, sorry. Yeah, you don't have to do it uh, on the yeah, spot, yeah. but that's, yeah. that's they they do cool. have they do have um, the training data. They have um, some checkpoints along the way. Uh, I think they even had like the loss curves and stuff like that. I could be wrong about that last point, but they they have enough where you can re reproduce it. I think. Yeah, and it, and if they're using a thirty eighty, then that means that you know we we all should have access to hardware good enough yeah 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 i did it on uh, the small one i did on a t4 uh, just a collab standard collab okay so um next week then we we can we, uh, i'll pull up a little bit more on that um that second paper um we can dive a little bit through the code if you'd like um, maybe look at a little bit of the, the um, diff user stuff. Um, and uh, Thanks, Roger. And so, all right. Well, thank you. Sorry for running a little bit long there.